something that I'm just going to start talking a bit about the project. And actually, the next topic that we're going to get into in the course uh, ties directly to how you will solve the project. So that's, that's a good timing for that. And then on Friday, Emily Nichols from Consensus uh, will be there. Emily took the course in 1963 uh, in 2010, and I taught it for the first time. And she's going to be talking about the projects that she and Molly had done. Um, and just kind of set the stage for, for what's required of the project. So we're going to see this topic of design experiments come up which leads to the rest of the course actually. So let's just talk about the course project. Right? Um, I will illustrate what we're looking for in the project by an example. So here, the first, uh, the first thing to be clear on is what's my objective. So, If I'm going to use this example of popcorn, I might consider the problem of maximizing yield. So my aim is, or my objective, is to maximize the yield of the popcorn. Now let me be specific on that, because objectives, we must be very clear on our mind where we're going. The maximizing yield is the mass of popcorn divided by mass of kernels. Okay. So two things that I can very easily measure, the mass of the popcorn and the mass of the kernels. So easy to measure. So some of you might be doing projects regarding taste of foods. That's hard to measure, how you measure taste. Some of you might be growing plants, measuring the height of the plant, the width of the leaf, easy to measure. Absorbency of paper towel, how do you measure that? Some of you might be doing experiments that you hope to look at something in your lab. And usually in the lab, we've got some good qualitative measurements, time for something to occur, for example. Okay, so when you think of your project, it's open-ended. You can pick an area that's a total interest to you, and that's desirable. So pick something that's meaningful to you, that's a problem that you're facing in your own life, or that you find to be interesting, those that make the best projects. So here, the objective is to maximize the yield of popcorn. It's a clearly specified objective. So by the way, no one's doing popcorn projects because we're going through this as a design. So first step is be clear on your objective. Second step is to start to decide what is going to influence it. Ideas, what might influence the yield of popcorn? <coughs> Some ideas? Brand of popcorn? Can I mention time? What specifically about it? a little bit, it's kind of going to apply in good source. The heat source type. Any other ideas? Who's made stove top popcorn? Back in the day. No microwave popcorn. Let's just talk about popcorn making a stove. What do you do? No, no one's made stove top popcorn. <laughs> Butter or oil? Butter or oil, so your oil type. Or... six, seven potential sources of variability, or seven things that are going to change. This is how we're going to do these experiments. So pay, let's pay careful attention. So when you submit your proposed experiment to me, I'm not going to write back to you and give you the same answer. And this usually happens. So 
let's pay attention here. When you identify step two, what you, what's going to influence your objective, take the following approach. Choose two levels. So brand A versus B. Time to eat. Short or long? Heat source type. Um, oh, okay, that could be here, gas or electric, actually. So we're down to six. Oil type, butter or oil? Heat setting. Low, high. Copper or aluminum? Okay, so choose binary levels. That's, that's how we're going to do experiments in this course initially, is we're going to look at binary levels. We do not have the time to look at three levels or four levels. We simply look at binary levels for now, and you'll quickly see how this scales up to multi-levels. Next important step, make sure that you can do all possible combinations. So here, I've got brand A. I must be able to run brand A at short heat with gas, using butter, on a low heat setting in a copper pan. I need to go through all possible permutations. How many are there? For one, two, three, four, five, six factors at two levels, two to the six experiments. That's 64 batches of popcorn you're going to be making. Okay? You must be able to make all 64 combinations. So sometimes people pick experimental variables which you cannot possibly combine. So make sure that all possible combinations, you're not going to make two to the six batches of popcorn. That's going to be costly and you're going to feel sick afterwards. <laughs> so we will learn how to do what are called fractional factorials. I will teach you how to do a reduced number of experiments but still get most of the information out of it. So you'll save time and money. So we're going to learn in your, and you will do this in your project, well, how can I do this maybe in 16 experiments, but still uncover the same amount of information, similar information. So that's part of the project. When you propose your project to me, step one, make sure your objective is 100% clear. What are you going to measure, and how are you going to measure it? So two things, what and how. Second step, what are you going to influence and vary? You may even decide, well, I'm going to there's so many things that influence it, but I'm going to hold certain factors constant. So step three then is what is going to be held constant? So that's going to reduce your number of factors. You may decide, well, you know what, I don't think but there is going to be a significant difference between copper and aluminum, so I'm going to take that out. I'm going to hold it constant, so I'm going to do all my experiments in an aluminum pan. This is going to have a reduced number of factors. I've chosen to hold certain factor constants. Okay, so make sure that you have a clear objective. What are you going to influence, or what, what have you identified in influencing it? Make sure that this is binary. Brand A versus brand B, low versus high, can be both qualitative and or quantitative. Is what I'm getting at there. The binary levels could be here. Low versus high, A versus B. So write up a little proposal on what you plan to do. Email that to me by the end of this week or the first thing next week, and I'll get back to you and I'll say, go ahead. You don't have to do it. But if you do it, you get, kind of get an idea of that you're on the right track. If you don't do it, uh, you want to pick up by the end of your project. You can take them off the coach. So, so try to get that into me soon, and I, I'll respond to you. So Emily will talk about this process in her talk on Friday, and how she applied it to make the markets. Questions? So you're definitely going to have more questions in the next class or two. Uh, so today's class, we will look at some topics of linear regression. We'll look at, inter uh, at, at uh, multiple regression. 
And on Thursday's class, we'll start to introduce design experiments. So print out the DOE notes on the course website uh, between today and, and Wednesday. And we'll start going into that section on Wednesday, Friday, and then we will talk and then we'll get into DOE's proper next week. So let's go and switch back to this topic of linear regression. If I go back a few slides, we're investigating our linear model. So we've built our model and we'd like to improve it. Some of the things we may notice is that our residuals are not normally distributed. So we spoke about the implication of that last class and how to detect it and how to deal with it. So normally distributed residuals are important. We also looked at non-constant error variance. How to detect it in a spot we see a plan shape perhaps, or some irregular distribution of residuals. How do we deal with it? There's several alternatives over there. And uh, one, the next topic we're looking at is independence. So the third topic is lack of independence. I spoke a bit about time series analysis, the autocorrelation function, and how we can use that autocorrelation function to quickly make sure our data are independent of each other. And then we ended all the last class by talking about this fourth potential problem with linear models. And that's if there's non-linearity in our data, and for chemical processes, we have mentioned that over a large enough range, we expect to see non-linearity. Uh, it's, it's totally expected that over wide ranges in our processes will deviate from linear, linear assumption. But if we're operating in a narrow window, which for most chemical processes we like to do, we don't like to move our processes all over the place, we like to keep them operating in a fairly defined window, we may find that we're fortunate that that process is actually linear in that rate range, and so using a linear approximation is quite okay. But we want to be able to detect when it's not okay. And here I've plotted x versus y. We can see there's a bit of an arc to the data, even though we've gone and fit a straight line. These residuals are all above the regression line, these residuals here are below the regression, and those are above. So we definitely expect to see some sort of structure in our residual plot. That becomes far more apparent when we do show the residuals on my y-axis versus x on the x-axis. I could obviously flip this around, it doesn't matter. The key is that I see, what am I looking for in the residuals? What should I expect to see in the residuals? Randomness, no structure. Here I'm seeing a clear structure. This blue line is not a quadratic formula that I superimpose on the plot. There's a beautiful function in R called Lois, which will superimpose the best fit of the line. And I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll show you how to use it. So the lowest, lowest curve is being added here for me. It immediately points out that there's some structure in my data here. If I plot residuals against Y hat, similar structure is observed. Or Y hat versus residuals. It doesn't matter which axis this go on. But the residuals are used on one axis and either X or the fitted Ys on the other axis. So that's how to detect it. What can we do about it? Well, we can say, well, let me recognize that that model really is nonlinear. Let me go fit a model which incorporates a nonlinear term. We don't have time to go into nonlinear least squares in this course. Here I describe one possible crude approach that you can use right now to do that, and that's just following a brute force grid approach and evaluating your objective function of minimum b squared at every point in the grid. You pick the combination on the grid that gives you the lowest error. That's a crude and perfectly valid way of doing it. But there are some alternatives that we will investigate. And the first one is to transform either my x or y variable or both. And the approach here is to take my x or y variable and raise it to some power p. So here I'm raising x to the p, x subscript original to the power p. And p could go what we call the ladder of powers. So I could start at the base level, which is 1. So x raised to the 1 just gives me my x variable back. But I could get more aggressive and raise to the power of 1.5, or 2 to make a quadratic term, or even higher still if I want it. Or I can go lower and twist the curve the other way. So x will square it, the other way will take it twisted the other direction. I can take it to the power of 
which is the square root transformation, or I can take it to the power of zero, which I'll talk about in a minute, or to the power of negative 0.5, or the power of minus one. That's going to invert the x. This is very, very common in chemical processes. We often find that one variable is inversely related to the other. The Antoine equation is a perfect example. Vapor pressure is inversely proportional to temperature. So let me not regress vapor pressure onto temperature. Rather, let me regress vapor pressure onto the inverse of the temperature. So I raise my x original temperature to the power of p minus 1. I can go to negative 1.5 negative 2. As I go away from this baseline of 1, I'm going more and more severe, either up or more severe down. This 0 corresponds to taking log of x. In terms of severity, 0 does what, um, what log of x would do. So you can't really take x to the power of 0, you just get a vector of 1, but the log of the vector x can be taken. So we have to pay a little bit of attention here though when we do this. When I take x of my original variable I log, I have to make sure that every entry in x here is greater than 0. Yeah, I can't take the log of a negative number. So one trick, if you want to call it that, is to take x original and bump it up by some constant offset c. Shift your x up to make all your x's positive, then take the log of it and then regress onto y. Or have to, uh, regress y onto that transform zero. Okay, so often we see little tricks like that. And some of the, the software will do this for you automatically. They'll find the minimum c and they'll bump up all your data first for you. But so, just be cognizant of that. Because now when you want to use your model in the future, you have to bring your new x variable add this constant offset, take the log of that, multiply by the regression coefficient to the prediction. Okay, so transformations work very naturally. R will do all the work for you. Let me uh, light up a few examples here for you and how you code it up in R. This is also on the course website in the software tutorial. Um, in section 17 or 18 on the software tutorial, you'll see a few examples of this. But let's say you wanted to fit y is equal to e0 plus p1 square root of x. So that's in other words, I'm transforming x to the power of 0.5. You could write in R lm y as described by square root of x. R will take the square root of x and use that to make its prediction of y. You will get a model object from this in the same way you would get a model object. You can calculate confidence intervals, you can calculate residuals. And one part of the software tutorial shows you how to use a model object on new data. So if I brought in a new x variable into this model, R would first square root it before it makes the prediction of y. So R takes care of all the background calculations for you. Another example of this might be if you wanted to take the log of y and regress it onto x. In R you'd say lm log of y as described by x. Or if you wanted to say y is equal to e0 plus b1 over x, so in other words, the transformation of x to the power of minus 1, you might be tempted to say, and this is incorrect, so don't write this down, you might be tempted to say y as described by 1 over 1 divided x. That's wrong. R will actually build a model of regressing y onto the constant b0 uh, uh, equal to the mean of y. It's really an insidious problem with R is that it will actually return a model to you that does exactly something that you don't expect it. So it's unfortunate that R does this. The correct way to do this 
is to use the as is operator and tell R, I want you to regress Y onto the following as I've written it. So I is called the as is operator, one divide X. <coughs> So if you're not sure what I does, type help I. I'll tell you what the as is operator is all about. So that's the correct way to specify this normal transformation. One other tool that you can use is you can first um, arrange your, your data ahead of time based on first principles knowledge. So I've given you this uh, example already. In the Antoine equation, the temperature is inversely proportional to the log of the vapor pressure. So take the log of y, take t and invert it and use those to make your predictions. Or if I have this model where the constant p is multiplied by a constant q raised to the power of x, I can first take logs on both sides. These ideas are not new to you. You've seen these in, in prior courses where we manipulate our data. And so now my least squares log is the log of y, my intercept is log of p, my slope coefficient is log of q. Or if I'm trying to predict a model where I've got 1 equals 1 divided by a constant p plus q multiplied by x, I'd like to estimate what the p and q are, I can invert the equation and then transform that into a linear model. So, so any one of these approaches are, can be used when you're observing some irregular structure in the data. Let's take a look now as a summary of how you should go about fitting a linear model. First step is plot your data. We often jump quite past this, but we can get quite far ahead by just plotting your data. You're going to immediately see nonlinearity. So without waiting to see it later on, you can recognize right up here you may need to do a nonlinear transformation already. Plot your data, first then fit your model. So L, N, Y as described by X. Call that variable model. Always use the following two commands right away after. A summary of model and the confidence interval model. Use the summary to look at R squared, to look at standard error, to look at whether the coefficients are significant or not from the confidence model. Visualize your data. So plot X against Y. Here's the lowest function I was referring to earlier. So plot x, y will generate a plot and put it on the screen. You now want to superimpose an extra line onto it, so we use the lines function. The lines function will superimpose on your existing plot. What are we going to superimpose? Show me what we would call the non-parametric regression smoother. The lowest is a shorter way of saying that. It's, what it does is it's quite nice. It takes as parameters the same order that you're plotting, x against y. So it's going to take x and y, and it's going to build a smoother internally that smooths x and smooths y and fit the smoother on top of that. So if my data, x against y, were really linear to begin with, that first line, first code over there, x versus y, is going to plot x against y and draw something like that. That might be x, y. The lowest smoother is going to simply do this for you. That's the best fit smooth line between x and y. Similar to the splines that Excel tends to fit when you um, choose to do that in Excel. If your data x and y have a nonlinear relationship, what Lois will do is it will have an output similar to this. So this is how I generate that blue curve. I plotted x against the residuals, and then my second line of code was Lois x against residuals, and then it shows me the blue fits smoother on top of that. So it gives you a smooth impression of your data, which is, which is, is good to have. If your data really are linear, the lowest smoother will superimpose the linear regression line. If your data are non-linear, the lowest regression line is going to deviate. So if I really had non-linearity there, I'd see two separate distinct lines. So lowest is a really good function. There's a lot of computation that goes on behind it to do that smoothing in an optimal manner. And usually the defaults for lowest work very well. Type help lowest to see how to alter 
the smoothing parameters, but in general, with um, just using it as is works great. The next line will superimpose the least squares model, that straight line that was summarized up here in the model object. What it will do, a line will pull out the slope and the intercept and, and draw in red here the regression line for you. Next step, let's go and investigate the residuals. Are they normally distributed? Q2 plot of the residuals. Plot the residuals against the x values. So a simple plot of x against the residuals. Plot the residuals in time order. Also look at the autocorrelation function. So we discussed that last class. Here's the R code for it. So model dollar residuals to pull out the residuals from the model. ACF will send that into the autocorrelation function. You should see no autocorrelation amongst the residuals. In other words, you should expect, what I mean by that is an autocorrelation function that looks kind of like this one over here. Only the first lag at zero is significant. All other lags are in between your, in between your line. I'm covering this one up because this example shows that. So this first spike should also be inside this region of no significant lag. So you only expect one spike at zero. All the other spikes should be within the limits. Um, Put your residuals against the fitted values. And similar to this, put your residual against x, put your residual against y hat, plot y hat against y. This is often what we do. This is the one that you usually look at in your courses, is to plot y hat against y. But there's so much more that you should be investigating as well. So in the next assignment, you'll, you'll have to generate some of those plots. Any questions on that before I move on to the next topic? So a lot of this code is given in the software tutorial on the course website. If, if, um, if you're not sure how to get the fitted values, how to get the residuals out, uh, please, please read through those uh, tutorials step by step and try them out yourself. Okay, now let's look at the multiple linear regression model. This is where we start to move into design experiments. We're going to use the multiple linear regression model when we analyze our data from DOEs. We're going to introduce more than one x variable. And we're at the point now in our course where right back at the beginning we were testing hypothesis tests, or we would prefer to use confidence intervals to test A versus B. So if I use catalyst A versus catalyst B, do I get an improvement in yield? That's an experiment. It's an experiment in one variable. We're now going to head off to experiments with two, three, four, or multiple variables. In order to answer whether those variables have a significant effect on Y, we need a tool to do that. The tool that we're going to use is multiple regression. So when we're working with a single X variable, confidence intervals are a great way to do it. So when we're working with multiple Xs, we need an extra tool that's multiple regression. So I'll introduce it to you slowly. Um, first with some examples. Here's three examples of why we would need it. Let me take the case where I'm currently predicting my reaction rate, y, as a function of temperature of concentration x1. So we know that from reactor design, that my reaction rate is going to be influenced by the concentration of the species. But I also know in the back of my mind that temperature will affect reaction rates, has a very strong effect on reaction rate. So that's okay, if I do all my experiments at the same temperature, I'll be quite okay. I'll be able to predict the effect of concentration and, and what it does to reaction rate quite fine. But I don't always operate at the same temperature. So how can I augment my understanding of the system with this additional variable? Let's transcribe that mathematically. It says I would like to predict reaction rates as some constant intercept plus the effect of concentration, plus this additional effect due to temperature. So we're going to augment our understanding by adding an extra term, and maybe a third or fourth or fifth term. So this is why multiple regression is important, because we can now bring in extra factors and start to understand what's going on. So understanding here is the purpose, not for better predictions. Understanding. We're going to actually interpret what that regression coefficient means. 
Another reason why you want to use multiple regression is to improve your predictions. So here I did not add that extra term to improve my predictions. I added the extra term so I can actually understand whether the temperature affects it or not and how it does so. Is that a positive or a negative effect? But I sometimes do also want better predictions. I might be using this model to make a soft assessment. So here, for example, might be predicting melt index, my y. Melt index being predicted from temperature alone, x1, might give me an adequate model, but I'm not getting the best predictions. When I build this model of only temperature to predict melt index, I might see some non-linearity in my residuals, or I might see some structure in my residuals that's not explained. Well, it might be that that's due to a second variable, P flow rate. So when I add a second variable to my model, my predictions improve and my residuals show no structure or much less structure. So that's the, often the main reason why people go ahead and add a second or third or fourth term into their linear model, is to improve their predictions and to remove that structure from the model. And then we'll see finally here that if we're operating a process where there's a discrete variable, an integer variable, such as mixing tank A versus mixing tank B versus mixing tank C, I will need to have more than one term in my model. So I can deal with the binary variable quite okay, but when that, when that variable, that integer variable, has more than two levels, I need to go to multiple terms in my regression model. So as long as I've got operator A versus B, I'm okay with a single X but if I've got operator A, B, and C, I'm going to need to add X1 and X2. So <coughs> integer variables at more than two levels, we need to go to multiple terms. So I'll, I'll show that by example in uh, the next part. Okay, let's mix up some things though. Before we get into multiple regression, we're going to introduce a little bit of new notation that we're going to need. We're going to take our intercept away. Our intercept B0 is kind of meaningless to us not totally meaningless, we can always get it back, but I'm going to force it to zero. I'm going to remove the intercept, it makes our notation a little easier to work with. So it's a simple little way to do it, is take my original model, yi for the ith observation is equal to an intercept plus a slope multiplied up by the ith x. That's one equation. I can write that same equation at the mean of x and at the mean of y. So x mean multiplied by the slope plus an intercept gets me my y mean. We know that is true because the least squares model always passes through x bar y bar. So both these equations hold. This first one holds for any data point, the second one always holds for a data set. Subtract equation one and equation from equation two. And that intercept disappears. B0 gets goes away. And I'm now only left with y minus y bar is equal to x minus x bar multiplied by the slope. Intercept fractions. We haven't lost the intercept. I can always figure out what the intercept was afterwards if I need it. But I'm going to work with this model now in deviation form. I'm going to forget about this model. We've worked with this model up here up to now. From now on, I'm going to work with the deviation formula. Very easy to use. Simply go to your data set and create two new variables. X original minus the mean of X. I'm going to call that X now. Y is equal to Y original minus the mean of Y. So create these two synthetic variables. Let's call them deviation variables. So a deviation variable for X and a deviation variable for Y. The mean of this x, this new x up here, and the mean of this new y is zero. Both of them have a mean of zero after creating the new deviation. We're going to have a far easier time working with deviation variables. The model is far easier to interpret. When we look at x transpose x, x transpose y matrices, which I'll talk about in a, in a second, those are going to be easy to work with. 
And so there's, there's a number of good reasons why we work with deviation tables. Interestingly, this slope, it may seem counterintuitive to you, but as you can prove here to yourself, this slope that you're going to estimate with deviation variables is the same slope as if I just gone and taken my raw data. Okay, so this V1 on this model is going to be the same as the V1 up there. So no, you're not going to get different numeric values. It's just going to make our, our life a lot easier afterwards on the interpretation. And that's the key thing, is interpreting our models. If you want to see it algebraically, uh, you can work through this up here. But um, what I'm saying is let's take a look at multiple regression. So now I'm going to not have just a single x variable. We're used to y is equal to b beta 1 x 1. Now let's add a beta 2 x 2 up to beta k x k. So let's use this terminology k, lowercase k represents the number of slope coefficients in my model. So I've got a beta 1 slope coefficient, a beta 2 slope coefficient, up to beta lowercase k slope coefficients. Each one of these slope coefficients gets multiplied by an x. So if I was working for the case where I was maybe using temperature as x1 and concentration as x2, Beta 1 will be the effect of temperature, beta 2 will be the effect of concentration. X1 will be temperature, X2 will be concentration. I've only got those two that I'm using to predict Y. So in that case, K is 2, lowercase k is 2. And I can write this equation out for every single observation for my I observation, YI, I've got XI for variable 1, xi for variable 2, up to xi for variable k. So let me take this equation for one observation and write it in matrix form. So this first equation here is identical to the second equation, just in matrix form. Let me make that matrix notation explicit. xi transpose times a vector beta. So I've got k slope coefficients. I have k terms of x. So my raw data here is x multiplied by the slope coefficient to use to predict the last data point. So that's the notation for one data point. If I had to write that for every data point that I record, I've got y1, y2 up to y lowercase n, I now make these matrices and vectors. So this matrix over here, capital X, is a matrix of raw data. Here's the key distinction, people often flip this around. Every row in matrix X represents a data point. Every column in matrix X represents a variable. So column one might be temperature. This is temperature for the first observation, temperature for the second observation, temperature for the nth observation. Column two might be concentration for the first, second, nth observation, and the final column. So columns are variables, rows are observations. This is a standard, standard notation data analysis. So let's make a note of this. If this is not something you're familiar with, capital X, my rows are observations. And my columns are variables. So up to now, you've been building least squares models where your capital X matrix only has a single column. You've only used a single variable multiplied by a single slope coefficient to predict your vector y. We're now going to take that up and go to multiple columns. We're going to have more than one variable, more than one column in X to make our prediction of y. And if you write that in matrix form, our least squares objective function converts over quite naturally. Our least squares objective function is to minimize the sum of squares of errors. So my error is y minus xb. E transpose e is a natural way to write sum of squares of the errors. So this is something that's important. Whenever you see in mathematical work, you'll often see this, for example, for those of you taking an optimization course. You should see a lot of variables transposed with each other. 
e transpose e is equal to sum of squares of the entries in e. There's another interpretation to this that's equally important. If I had x transpose x, lower, or let me sorry, let me just use y as an example. If I had y transpose y, if y is in deviation form, In other words, y has already been centered, as I showed in the previous slide. Then y transpose y is proportional to the variance of y. in deviation form. If y is in deviation form, that implies that y bar is equal to zero. The mean of y is zero. So the sum of squares, y transpose y represents the sum of squares of y. If that's what this notation means, and I'm telling you that's true, the sum of squares of the entries in that vector well, y transpose y then is equal to y i minus y bar sum of squares. And since y bar is zero, that term goes away. And so this is directly proportional to the variance of y. So one thing, if you're trying to make sense of mathematical notation and you see a vector transpose itself, First thing that must come to your mind right away, that that's simply a variance. That's all it means. So if you want to convert mathematics to English, this is simply minimizing the variance of the residuals. What that first line is saying. And I can expand it, and this term over here, y transpose y, is the variance of my y's, or proportion to the variance of my y's. So important side side points that I just wanted to have. Now, if we take this objective function, fb, b is a vector, I can take the partial of that function with respect to every entry in b, and set that individually equal to zero, work through the mathematics, and we get the famous equation that you should never forget, b is equal to x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Very, very key expression that comes up everywhere, not just in these squares, but in so many models, it's quite, quite intriguing how frequently it comes up. We're going to learn what x transpose x means, and we're going to learn what x transpose y means. What it comes down to is that they're equal to the correlations. And so when we learned about correlations at the start of this course, it was for a very good reason. Because the entries in x transpose x represent the correlations and covariances in x, and x transpose y is the same thing. Let me just, I'll, I'll jump over this slide, I'll come back to it next class, but I did want to end off with an example where we look at that. So let me take a case with two variables. I've got one vector x. And I've got a second vector x, so x1, x2. Here's my raw data for them. The first n vector there, <coughs> six data points, so n. n in this example is 6. k is equal to 2 in this particular case. So n, number of rows is 6. k is equal to 2. So very, very important to mention those because back up here, we need to make sure that when I create my y and my x matrices that I have the correct dimensions. y is an n by 1 vector, one entry for every observation. x is n by k, one row per observation, one column per variable. So here's my raw data for x. 
my raw data for x, uh, x1 and my raw data for x2. If I create deviation variables, I find the mean of that first vector, and I find the mean of the second vector. And I subtract the mean from the entries in x1 at a time, in x1, and I subtract the mean from the entries in x2, one at a time. So I'll get two new vectors now that I use. I forget about my raw data after this. I'll throw my raw data away and only going to work with these deviation variables now x1 and x2. If I calculate the mean of, of x1, it's zero. The mean of x2 is also going to be zero. Y does not need to be written in deviation form. You certainly can write in deviation form, but it's not. Uh, oh, no, it's true. Let me take it back. I will do that in an assignment question. 600 real students will prove that for themselves. We will take deviation variables because it fits naturally for design experiments. So do take the deviation of y, take your raw data for y, and subtract the mean of that part as well, and you get a deviation vector y. It's easier to work with deviation variables consistently, so we'll do that. So I've taken deviation variables there, and I've assembled my x matrix. There's my data for column one, variable one, minus four and a half, two and a half, one and a half, up to three and a half. Variable two, four, 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 one, minus two, minus four, minus three. So column two represents my second variable, my y vector. What do you notice about the columns in x? What was the relationship between x1 and x2? inverse relationship, and it's far more apparent once they're in deviation form. Notice how quickly it jumps out at you, how these are inversely correlated. You can certainly see that in the raw data, but once you're in deviation form, it stands out far, far quicker, especially with those signs pointing out at you. So as x variable 1 goes up, x variable 2 goes down. They're negatively correlated with each other. What is the relationship between x1 and y? The first variable's relationship to x1. relationship between x2 and y. Take a look at x transpose y matrix. This is the covariance between x and y, is what the interpretation is. You can prove that to yourself mathematically if you write out x transpose y and you get the same formula for covariance there. The first entry is positive, indicating that x1 is positively correlated with y. The second entry is negative, indicating the second column in x has an inverse relationship to y. So that comes out right away in x transpose y, even though you may not have seen it in my raw data. Here you see it because my raw data are sorted. But if I make these rows in a different order, that, that relationship still exists, but it would not be apparent, it wouldn't jump out on the page. Anymore. But this correlation number, even if I reorder these rows in x and y, I will get the same values here, and I will get the same sign. So instantly I see a positive relationship between x1 and y. Take a look at this at home. Identify what the signs and the interpretation of the four entries in x transpose x mean. How do you interpret that 55 value? What does it mean? What does the minus 57 mean? You'll take a subject to 